Hey class, welcome back. I hope you guys are all uh, doing well here as we are facing this uh, pandemic. Uh, one thing I did want to mention here before we get into the, the video is uh, just a note about the exam coming up this week. It's scheduled for, as I'm recording this, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, coming in towards the end of March of uh, 2020, uh, but uh, as I'm recording this, it's scheduled for next Thursday. Uh, the seminary, a college and seminary has approved a relaxation on uh, the proctor uh, requirements. And so, and I'll have a note on Moodle about that. Uh, but the seminary and college is not requiring um, the proctors to be like the non relation and all of that because people are kind of quarantined or staying at home, forced to stay at home. Uh, family members um, are allowed to be the proctor. Now, having said that, they also gave advisement to all the professors that we uh, can also go for the honor system. And frankly speaking, I know uh, I'm, I'm in seminary myself. Um, you, you know, I, I'm an a ordained minister, and even though I'm not pastoring a church right now, um, I'm just I just want to share with you that uh, um, I, I teach you and, and all of that, uh, but. If someone went and uh, violated an honor system and cheated during an exam, uh, they're going to have to answer to a higher, a lot higher power uh, than than me. Uh, you you have to answer to God, and so uh, if someone is uh, on the honor system of pro with the proctoring and and they uh, are self proctoring, basically that's what it comes down to, and 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 that person cheats, they're answering to God. They can get a hundred on the exam, but that's just that's that's temporary. Uh, but uh, sin against God must be dealt with. So uh, me saying all of that, uh, I am going to be leaning towards uh, you guys doing a self-proctoring uh, exam. It'll be on Moodle, which, by the way, I have to figure out how to do that. Um, I have the exam written up in Word, uh, but uh, I want to try to get it onto Moodle so you guys can just log in and then, and then take the exam over at Moodle. Uh, the paper exams that we did in the past, uh, I found that very easy and convenient. Typed up in Word, emailed it off. You guys took it, emailed it back. I mean, it was not difficult at all, even though it was kind of old-fashioned. Uh, probably a lot uh, uh, more time-consuming uh, for me to try to enter an exam into Moodle. I don't know, especially a history exam with possibly uh, more than 50 questions. I think this exam actually has 50 questions on it. So anyway, uh, that long whole story is to say that you guys will most likely, um, it'll be, instructions will be on Moodle for you, but most likely you will be uh, self-proctoring your exams. You will not need to have someone proctor it for you, and you will be able to um, uh, basically, I guess, see the grade right at the end of the exam. It's going to be on the honor system which uh, again I'm, I'm fine with the seminary has and college has uh, uh, approved that that you we can do the self proctoring uh, be on the honor system uh, for this time that we're suffering through this pandemic okay enough said about that uh, today in our PowerPoint lecture we will be looking uh, have some introductory material but then we will be looking at uh, Benito Mussolini who becomes the dictator of Italy he was a fascist dictator and um, and we're going to be looking at him. We're only going to look at him up until about 1930s, mid 1930s, because uh, once we then we're going to look at Hitler. Once we get into World War II, we'll be looking at Mussolini again. Okay, so stay tuned for the. Power okay, this is our uh, PowerPoint part two for the interwar period between 1919 and 1939. Uh, but we're not going to talk about the uh, latter part of the 30s. Uh, until we get more with the rise of the Nazis, but uh, this uh, this intro slide I didn't I didn't talk about this last time, but this intro slide my son made this up for me a collage of uh, different uh, images from the 20s. Uh, so we want beer, so that's prohibition. You have a guy down here who's pouring alcohol. You know these guys down here, um, obviously uh, illegal alcohol into these canisters. Uh, this is uh, at a speakeasy uh, where you have the lady dancing. Uh, she was called a flapper. This is the the dance style. Was called, you know fl they were called flapping. They were called flappers. Um, some guys that are unemployed up here. You know, so lost all in the stock market. Hundred dollars will buy this car. So during the Great Depression, some people around the radio. This will be later on. 
the radio became more and more important during this time period. Okay, so uh, interwar period. Today we're going to be talking about post-war treaties and then uh, the rise of Mussolini. Uh, post-war treaties, the Locarno Pact was signed in London on December 1st, 1925. It was seven agreements negotiated in Locarno, Switzerland. And basically what it was was the allies who won World War I and the new states in Europe attempted to negotiate some things. They attempted to negotiate some territorial settlements, especially between the borders of Germany with France and with Poland. So remember Germany, that map I showed you last lecture, France is on the western side of Germany and the, the borders that were going to be um, basically re reestablished there. And then with Poland, now Poland is a new country, and so where is it that uh, the, the border of Germany and Poland is going to be? which would be a, a sticking point for Hitler. I mean, obviously, the beginning of World War II uh, is 1939 when Hitler invades Poland. Uh, they also negotiate relations of defeated peoples, especially Weimar Germany. You know, so uh, just the relations between countries. Um, one of the uh, statements that occurs in the Locarno Pact, which Germany does sign... Because they want to, they do want some entry into the League of Nations. So uh, they do sign this: is that Germany would never go to war again, which is uh, I found that I found that interesting, because not too long after this, Germany will go to war again. So um, it's interesting that this Locarno Pact says that uh, Germany was promised entry into the League of Nations, and this is known as the Spirit of Locarno. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles set out to punish Germany. The war guilt clause, the high repar war reparations, the the winner, the uh, Allies wanted to, to punish Germany. But under the Locarno Act, there's this spirit of Locarno, which is kind of like a uh, an, uh, an olive branch given out to Germany. Like a, a, we want to we want to have peace. We want to have a spirit of uh, almost of, of mercy to you and. And, um, you know, for, for if you agree to these things, we will allow you into the League of Nations. And so they do. So they, um, they signed this, that they would uh, not go to war again. Obviously, Hitler would renounce this treaty in 1936. And the way he renounces it is the remilitarization of the Rhineland. So remember, at the end of World War I, um, the German military could not be in the Rhineland, which was a border area with France. And in 1936, Hitler invades the Rhineland with his military. Now, the Rhineland is still Germany, but he brings his military into the Rhineland. Now, there had not been military in the Rhineland for a long time. In 1936, it, it, there had been not been any military in the Rhineland since the end of World War I. So this, uh, this action by Hitler is very provocative to the French and to the British and all, they're like, yeah, you know, the military is not supposed to be in there and you just sent them in. So um, Hitler renounces this treaty. Uh, the second one we're going to talk about is the Kellogg-Briand uh, Pact of 1928. Uh, this was an international peace treaty negotiated between the United States and um, the French and basically, it was the U.S. Secretary uh, of State, Frank Kellogg, and French Foreign Minister, Aristide Briand. And uh, they have this pact. Uh, they renounce war as a way of settling disputes. And what happens is, the reason that this is international is not just because it was the United States and French, but um, almost every world government uh, joined up with this pact, and they signed this pact. And it was to maintain and guarantee peace around the world. Okay, but again, all these all these treaties they always fail. Um, it was signed by Germany, but eleven years later, World War II is going to begin. So it doesn't matter what man does, treaties they come up with, sign these pacts, whatever. It's always going to uh, devolve into um, some kind of a crisis and then war. 
Okay, we're going to talk about Italy now, which is going to set us up for Mussolini at the end of this PowerPoint lecture. Uh, but uh, post-war Italy, uh, switching sides. What happens is World War I begins, and, and Italy uh, doesn't really know what to do. Uh, they, they're not sure who to align with. And so at first, they basically nominally, nominally are allied with the central powers. They don't do too much. They don't, they're not like you know on the front lines fighting with Germany or anything. They're just they're down there. They've uh, kind of aligned themselves with Germany, with Austro-Hungary, um, but they're not doing too much. And the reason that they're allied with them is that in 1882 they signed an alliance with Germany and Austro-Hungarian empires. So this is an old alliance by now. Uh, so you're talking by 1914. You're talking an alliance. Uh, that is uh, basically what was that, 32 years old. So they're they're there. Uh, they're nominally allied with the Central Powers, but when World War One begins, um, they start kind of weighing their options, and they want to see what both sides can offer, and they're going to line up with the one that they believe uh, what side can offer the most to them, and so they. Um, actually ally themselves in 1915 they switch sides and they ally themselves with the allies okay and now again they don't do too much in world war one there's there is the italian front of world war one which is basically mountain warfare they're fighting in the alps uh down there in the italian alps but it's not a huge area for uh for world war one the way they do this in 1915, they secretly sign the Treaty of London and they switch over and join up with the Triple Entente, which is the Allies. But again, like I said, they don't do too much. Now, Italy had hoped for territorial gains after the war that they would, um, you know, they, they ally themselves with the, with the winners and they're going to get something, but really they get very little. And so what happens is the peasants and the workers, who were basically the soldiers for the Italians in World War I, um, they expected more, and they didn't get it. So what happens is they create the, the Communist Party of Italy. Now, the Communist Party of Italy also doesn't really pan out for anybody and doesn't give what they promise. And they only existed from 1921 to 1926. And the reason being is that uh, with the rise of uh, Mussolini, more and more people are disenfranchised by the Communist Party in Italy, and they lean more and more towards the fascist government, which is established in Italy, and many people join the fascist side of things, and they end up um, going, the Communist Party ends up going out of any kind of existence by 1926 because of the fascist government making communism illegal. So we're going to talk here about fascism. Uh, fascism, I have a definition here, they're highlighting yellow, a form of government with a one-party dictatorship. This government is usually accompanied by a military government with the leader or dictator as the head of the military. Please do not confuse fascism and communism. Fascism and communism are not the same, which we're going to see here coming up. Fascism is characterized by strong nationalism. Okay, communism is de by definition, communism is not sh uh, for strong nationalism. Okay, therefore, strong people movement. Um, fascism is extreme authoritarianism. Okay, a, a dictator in charge. Again, socialism is not that way. Uh, it's more of the, the people rule, not a dictator rule. Um, and then, obviously, fascism, because of what I just said, is known for hostilities toward liberals and Marxists or communists. And what you do is you have to look at, look at it on a, like a spectrum, where you have uh, the center of a spectrum, and on the far right is going to be the fascists, and on the far left is going to be the Marxists. And... So you have the right wing and the left wing of a prism or a spectrum. Now, the uh, far right, which are going to be the fascists, 
they're the ones that will be aligned with a dictator, authoritarian rule, strong national identity. Um, this will be Mussolini. This is going to be Hitler. Uh, this will be the emperor of Japan. These are fascist governments. On the far side, on the left, or the left wing, is uh, the communists. And they're going to be more aligned with rights of the people, the people rule, the people control the wealth, the people control the, the uh, production, the government, all of that. And so if you don't want to go as far left as communist, then you go just a little bit left. And that's more of like the socialist. And then you have the center of the scale, and then you start getting more to the right. And we kind of have the same, you know, where where do we fit in our country with a democracy, um, which we're actually we're a republic, but we have a democratic government. We're more kind of in the center, and so you have the right wing and the left wing of of in the United States. And so if you if you look at the center of a of a scale and you look at like neo-nazis neo-nazis are going to be far right radicals but then if you look at the communists in the in, in our country they're going to be on the far left okay so it's like where do where do you fall on this um this spectrum well in europe that many of the especially during leading up to World War II, you're going to have many going towards the far right. The Nazis are far right. Fascist Italy is far right. Compared to communism, which is far left. And so here's some differences. Fascism and communism differences. Fascism does not seek state ownership of means of production. Okay, that's what communism says, that the state owns production it goes out to the people, all about equality and, and economic equality and all of that, anti-capitalist, all of that. No. Fascism does not seek any of that. Fascism does not seek economic equality. Uh, they, they don't care about state-owned production. They, are, they want a more of a capitalistic production. So, for example, um, in Nazi Germany, who did they rely on? They relied on Krupp. K R U P P, uh, Krupp production. They produced so much of the armaments. They they relied on on um, Mercedes Benz. They relied on Volkswagen. Um, these are these are corporations that funded and and pro produced the war machine for Nazi Germany. It wasn't the Nazi government producing this war machine. It was uh, companies producing the war machine so fascism um they they really aren't concerned about economic equality they're concerned about uh income through capitalism fascism is very nationalistic okay uh, communism is not communism is not nationalistic where you have this uh, uh national identity where again in, in fascist nazi germany they align themselves with being Nazis and Nazi Germans. Okay, uh, communism is not like that. Uh, interwar fascist states: uh, Italy, 1922 to 43, with dictator um, uh, Benito Mussolini. Uh, Germany was obviously 33 to 45, the Third Reich, and that, that was Adolf Hitler. Uh, Japan was the emperor there in Japan. Austria. Now Austria was a fascist state at first, but then um, they, they were because they were very loyal to Germany. Uh, but they were annexed in 1938. It's called the Anschluss. They were annexed in 1938, which um, caused a lot of problems with the other European powers, mainly Great Britain. <clears throat> and Austria formally became part of the Third Reich in 1938. Okay, so Benito Mussolini, 1883 to 1945, uh, his early life, um, his dad was uh, Alessandro Mussolini. He was a blacksmith and a socialist. His mom, Rosa, was a Catholic school teacher. 
Uh, Bonito uh, worked as a teacher and a journalist. But then he, when the World War I came around, he fought in World War I for the Italian Army. He was wounded in action. He returned from the war and became a journalist for the remainder of the war. And he was a strong nationalist. So right there, he's going to start, uh, ideologically, he's going to start lining up with the far right, being a strong nationalist. And he opposed anyone that was anti-nationalistic. So who is anti-nationalistic? The communists. They're going to be anti-nationalistic. And so after the war, he formed the fascist party in Italy, which was a strong right-wing nationalist party. And one thing they did was they wore black shirts. Uh, for some reason, uh, during this time, political parties would have um, almost kind of like uniforms. And they wore black shirts. Uh, Hitler it was the brown shirts, which was called the SA. They wore uh, brown shirts. So uh, very nationalistic, very right wing. Uh, many times they were armed. They would definitely, um, they wouldn't go out there unarmed when they would go confront communists, they would be armed. And so the right-wing fascist party would commit terrorist attacks on communists. Uh, they would intimidate anyone that was like leaning communist, make, making sure that they would uh, not do any kind of communist uh, activity. So it was definitely right-wing against left-wing, the fascists against the communists, and Benito Mussolini being the fascist leader. Here's uh, some pictures. Mussolini in the early 1900s. Here he is as a World War I soldier and then dictator in 1930. And the reason we're talking about uh, Mussolini and Italy uh, before we get into Germany is because uh, Mussolini came to power before, uh, before Hitler. So uh, by the time Hitler comes to power in 1933, Mussolini had already been dictator for a while. In Italy, so Italy was already a fascist state established. Um, they ended up getting in trouble in North Africa, and uh, with their expansion, we'll talk about that in a little bit later. But uh, Mussolini, he's out doing his thing. He's a fascist dictator. So his rise to power again, he had uh, the black shirts were the fascist group, and what they did was they formed into bands of thugs within the uh, the country in cities and in towns, uh, they would form bands of thugs that would uh, go around and beat up and terrorize the the communists. Um, this was uh, these thugs were mostly discontented veterans of World War One. Again, they didn't get what they thought uh, they were going to get after the war ended, and so they were discontented veterans that had that camaraderie and had that uh, kind of organization, and they came together. And this is the exact same thing takes place in Germany, uh, but here in Italy it ha it happens, and they're strong supporters of Mussolini, who are fascists, uh, who's a fascist, and so um, these black shirts become very very powerful. Uh, they were champions of law and order, and so uh, any kind of uh, communist um, rebellion and, and again, communism is kind of like. Uh, I don't want to say they're not law-abiding, law but if if the national if the nation is um, the nation of laws and people are very nationalistic, and those nationalistic people are more on the right, then the the law and order is going to be protected by those on the right, and those on the left aren't going to be concerned too much about law and order. These guys would violently attack communists, socialists, radicals, and progressives. There's an event that takes place in 1922 called the Black Shirt March of 1922, where 200,000 black shirts marched on Rome. And this is actually what brings Mussolini to power uh, and begins the fascist rule in Italy. Uh, the Black Shirt March of 1922, there's a picture there of Mussolini. This is Mussolini here. I'll bring that cursor. Right here, that, that's, I'm circling his head. Uh, that's Mussolini. And this is a picture of the Black Shirt March of uh, 1922. Uh, when the 200,000 march into Rome, the government in Rome is scared, and so they resign. And Mussolini, uh, basically, 
um, calls this his conquest of power. But in reality, it was more of a transfer of power within the framework of the Italian Constitution. The Italian Constitution, which is a a, a, um, constitutional monarchy, uh, allows for changes of government underneath of the king. And so basically, constitutionally, this just looks like a change in government. The government that's there is gone, is dissolved, and a new government is established. And so really, it's not a conquest of power. It's more of just a change of government. And Mussolini was made prime minister under the king of Italy. And this still, um, it's still what, it's what takes place. King Victor Emmanuel III makes Mussolini the prime minister. So constitutionally, no, no real like conquest of power. But what happens is, constitutionally, the prime minister, who is now Mussolini, has the ability to have dictatorial powers for up to a year and create a new government. And that's exactly what he does. He creates a new government, a fascist government. So here's a picture of Mussolini in Rome um, after the Black Shirt March of 1922. So these guys here, I mean, again, they're wearing their medals. These medals would have been like from World War One, you know, very kind of militaristic kind of a thing. And now you have Mussolini here in the center of the picture. This guy's wearing here's a holster. He's wearing a pistol. So very militaristic. Uh, here's a picture of um, Mussolini standing on the balcony after his um, takeover, fascist takeover. Again, wearing the military uniform, and that's what he would wear. Okay, so under his rule, the Lateran Agreement of 1929 takes place, and this is uh, where the Vatican is recognized as an independent state within Italy, and that's a 109-acre sovereign territory that belongs to the Catholic Church. It doesn't belong to Italy. It belongs to the Catholic Church. And what happens is, in this agreement, Article Number 20 says that in return for this established, sovereign, Roman Catholic, Vatican state, all the bishops would be loyal to the Italian state, which is fascist. And this will be very important during World War II when uh, the Pope gives his backing to Hitler. Uh, There's also the bachelor's tax of 1927. And this uh, this tax was kind of interesting. It's a tax based on their race. So it affected basically pure Italians. And it doesn't, when I say race, it doesn't get as as bad as as, uh, like the Jews in Germany or anything like that, the pure, the Aryan race in Germany. It doesn't get to that extreme uh, because really Mussolini didn't do much with Jews at all until until the war starts uh, and pressure from the Nazis to start deporting their Jews. But uh, it was kind of, it, it was race-based that uh, the Italians who were pure-blooded Italian men uh, would be taxed if they did not marry pure-blooded Italian women. And what this was for was to obviously to propagate the a pure Italian race, but also it was to uh, produce children who would become soldiers. So, and, and Hitler did the same thing. Uh, but uh, this bachelor's tax would force a tax on unmarried men. And so it really what it was, it was an incentive to have these men to get married and then have children. Uh, by 1936, the tax was over half of a tax uh, of the taxes that a bachelor paid. So if the, at the end of the year, if you looked at how much tax a bachelor had paid, half of those taxes would be, be the bachelor tax. Role of Italian women. Um, women were very important to the Italians and to the Germans during this time this interwar years, that is going to lead up to World War II. Um, women were looked at as um, as very important. They were given respect. Okay, when I, So when, when I'm talking about this uh, here today, and obviously with the Germans too, don't, don't think that women were not respected because this was, um, this was a different time. You know, more women, it was more traditional with families. So women would be at home, women, women would be mothers, having children, all of that. Uh, men would be more in the workplace, so don't think I'm not uh, that it's a disrespect. The Italians and the Germans had great respect for women. 
Okay, uh, their ideal woman were, women were uh, submissive wives and strong mothers. Uh, the ideal women would be happy to raise large families, and they were holder of traditional family values. And again, many, many women in these countries, uh, that's what they did, and they were happy doing it. It wasn't like they were forced to do it. They were, they were happy doing it. This is what they believed that their role in their society was, was to be um, you know, good wives, good mothers, raise children, all of that. In fact, uh, many of these women... Uh, in the country, and I'm talking about uh, countrywide movements, they would be given um, awards and and incentives and all kinds of things for being mothers. In in Germany, definitely, uh, Hitler, uh, the wives and mothers in Hitler, uh, Hitler's Germany, would be given these um, medals that they would wear out in public to show that you know I am one of the the uh, women who are supporting the government and supporting our leader and and all of that. So basically what happens is girls were taught from an early age and also in Italian youth groups uh, to focus on attaining this ideal uh, for the role of women. Now, we'll talk about the youth groups later, especially with the Hitler uh, Youth, which was the, uh, the Hitler Jugend was the, the name of the Hitler Youth, um, which was compulsory youth group attendance. Well, it's the same thing in Italy and actually first in Italy. Uh, where they had these youth groups. Now, don't think youth group like church youth group. They definitely had a different idea for their youth group. But they um, they focused on basically indoctrinating their children to believing this so that when the children grew up, they would uh, follow the, the government's lead. And so these girls would be indoctrinated to grow up to be submissive wives, to get married, and to have children. Obviously, the whole purpose of this is to produce children for the government to uh, the government's disposal that they could uh, have big militaries have strong nations through their military Mussolini believed that a strong peasant farming woman was the best mother and again that was the same thing with Hitler it was this, this idea of uh, of being you know of the earth of the land of the farm uh, you know the the strong mother that's out there taking care of the children and planting with her husband and harvesting. Uh, this was the ideal, um, and that's what uh, uh, that's what uh, Hitler did too. Uh, the marriage loan incentive was a government incentive for uh, for couples uh, to marry, and when the couples married, the uh, the loan would then be given to them to help them out to establish a home, to buy a house, to buy land, to establish a family. And the reason I put this underneath the role of Italian women was that if, uh, I'm supposed to say if down there as a typo, uh, it's not ID, it's if, I-F, id, <laughs> no, if a woman had four or more children, the loan was forgiven. So, you know, the good Italian woman who would go and get married and then the good Italian wife would go produce children and then their loan was forgiven. So that money was basically free, uh, quote unquote free, after having children. Um, well, that's just a duplicate of that slide. But I put down here at the bottom, uh, we'll, uh, we will pick up more of Mussolini in World War II lectures. Okay, because he's going to be more important in World War II too, also. Here's a picture of some boys of an Italian fascist youth group. And, I mean, look at these, these kids. I mean, these, these are young. These are definitely like uh, maybe older elementary age, maybe fourth grade, fifth grade, maybe, third, third, fourth, fifth grade maybe. Um, they're armed. They have guns. Now, these guns would probably be uh, um, a small arm, uh, probably like a, a, maybe a twenty two caliber, not, not a very heavy arm. It's not like they're out there shooting like heavy weapons, but just so they can go out there. It's kind of like militarized Boy Scouts. They have uniforms. They have, uh, this is their bedroll around their arm. They have a belt on with uh, probably cartridges inside this belt. Here's their weapon. They have uh, this headgear on. I mean, they're having fun. They belong. They're camaraderie. It's kind of like the, kind of like the Boy Scouts, but here they're armed. Uh, Hitler did the exact same thing. 
Uh, here's a, um, a group, a, a photograph of girls of the Latorio fascist youth group. Uh, this photo is dated 1920, uh, 1936, so later on, so pre-World War II. But notice the age. Uh, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe 13, 14 years old. You know, so these girls in, in three, four years, you know, they're going to be coming around the time of marriage. And, and they've been indoctrinated to produce children. Um, so they'll go and get married to a... You know, a young man who is probably a young man who grew up in one of these. So this young man's indoctrinated in the youth group, and the young lady is indoctrinated in the youth group, and they they know their role in society, and so they're going to go out there and they're going to get married and produce children, so that they can those children would then grow up to be loyal soldiers for the um, uh, for the nation. Now, of course, that plan would not come to fruition to where they would grow, the, that these women would have children to grow up to be soldiers because um, if they got married in 1940 and had children, obviously the war would end by, by four, 1945 and these nations would collapse. So the idea is there to produce these uh, large militaries and all of that, but it never really comes to fruition because the war would end in 1945. Notice on the back here on the wall, it says uh, uh, Duque, D-U-C-E. Uh, that's, um, it means the leader in, uh, in in Italian. I'm having problems here with my, my typos. It's supposed to be uh, on the wall. Okay, so that's it for, uh, uh, for the war, in interwar period. Okay, class, uh, that's going to be it for Benito Mussolini. Uh, we will definitely pick him up again during World War II. Uh, but next time we're going to be looking at, uh, we'll be focusing in, looking at um, uh, Adolf Hitler, the rise of, uh, the rise of Hitler. And, uh, and that's going to be it uh, for this week. Again, this week only has two sessions, session one, session two, which in the syllabus is like a, a Tuesday and a Wednesday. Now online, you guys, the, the stuff goes live on uh, Sunday at midnight, I get the videos up and, and the week opens up for you for the, the upcoming week, uh, Sunday at midnight. So you can begin uh, whenever, Monday, Tuesday, uh, but you, I mean, you can watch all of these sessions in one day. I don't care. But what I'm saying is that um, it's supposed to be for Tuesday and Wednesday and then Thursday is scheduled for the exam. So obviously you're going to be looking at Moodle and, uh, and to, to be able to take uh, the exam. And there'll be instructions in Moodle for that. Um, other than that, uh, I don't really have anything else. Um, start thinking about that second paper topic. A couple of students have already uh, sent me some emails for approval of their topics. So make sure you um, uh, send me uh, an email there um, for uh, approval of your second paper topic. Uh, other than that, I don't have anything else. If you have any problems, shoot me an email. Take care.